kept, kept talking at, at the coffee break. And, but now, now I think we are, we are back and, and uh, we have two presentations about the, our, our topic from the publishers. The first one is by, from, from Andrew Plum, at, who is representing Elsevier Publishing. And, and uh, yes, so Andrew, just go ahead and uh, you have 15 minutes to you know, say what, you, what, what, what your, your perspective on these uh, discussions on open citations are. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing your time with me today. I've got, as you say, just 15 minutes. So I'm going to be very brief. Do you see my slides and hear me clearly? Yes. Yes. Very well, thank you so much. So um, welcome everybody. Thank you for your time today. I'm going to go through this as briefly as I can uh, to afford good time for conversation afterwards. So my name is Andrew Plum. I serve as president of a unit called the International Center for the Study of Research here at Elsevier. I'm based in Oxford, England, calling you from here today. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, something that we call ICSR Lab, which is an open data platform for accessing large data sets in a computational platform. But before I do, I just want to recognize how much we have in common on a couple of points related to research evaluation and metrics and their use in that in that sense, because here at the International Center for the Study of Research, we have a mission to try to bring more evidence to the practice of research strategy, research evaluation, and research policy. And I was so gratified to learn uh, recently from your website about a joint statement on exactly this across the informatics societies uh, and organizations across uh, Europe. Um, so I was really, really pleased to see that document. It almost perfectly recreated uh, the script, the, the way we've been talking about it at ICSR for the last two years. I wanted to highlight as well just how close we are on this, because that document really felt strongly inspired by two statements about responsible use of metrics in research evaluation. And one is the Leiden Manifesto, published in 2015, and the other is DORA, published in 2013. I'm so pleased to say that in 2020, Elsevier, my parent organization, endorsed the Leiden Manifesto and signed DORA. And in signing DORA, we have also made the reference metadata, the reference list from all Elsevier published publications available in Crossref, deposited those in Crossref, and they're available openly through the Crossref API even now. So I thought that was something where we are absolutely on the same page on some of these issues. But that's not really what I want to talk to you about today. I wanted to introduce you to ICSR Lab. So what the lab is, is it's a sandbox environment for researchers to run technical, bibliometric, largely bibliometric analyses for non-commercial scholarly research purposes. You would want to be using the lab if your primary aim is to learn something new and publish a paper about it to tell everybody. So this lab allows you access to Elsevier's metadata. That includes Scopus, the Bibli Bibliometric Bibliographic Index Scopus, Plum X metrics, also widely known as alt metrics or alternative metrics. And importantly, it's absolutely free of charge. The data itself and the computational environment we wrap the data up in are completely free to the researcher. We bear the costs on our side. All we expect is that the researcher would end up publishing their study uh, and uh, acknowledging their data source when they do so. That's, that's really it. So why we started ICSR Lab, it's, by the way, it's about a, just over a year and a half old. Um, and so it, it's relatively new. If you haven't heard of it before, uh, this is your chance to learn about it. What we're doing here is opening up raw data that power these big Elsevier products, and you can do big data analytics across them. I'll clarify what I mean by big data in a moment. It extends access to the volumes of data far beyond what you can get from the APIs that are available for, for Scopus product or Cyval or any of the other products that we're including here. There is a very transparent process to get access. I'll tell you about that in a moment. And it's a self-service environment, but we have a data scientist whose role it is to support your work in the lab if you're a researcher in here and using the lab. Why do we want it available to you? To test innovative methods, explore new algorithms, create new metrics and indicators that are not yet standard, 
and share and iterate that code with others in the community so they can build on what you're doing as well. And ideally, we envisage a community of researchers working alongside each other in this lab, either simultaneously or asynchronously, because lab users can be all around the world, and meeting collaborators, exchanging ideas, collaborating across institutions where you've got a particular research project that involves people from multiple different places. We can span those boundaries using the lab. And importantly, I'm going to talk to this in a little moment, uh, reproducibility of research, a, a key benefit of open uh, research is built into the platform. We've got some really clear ideas of how we're supporting reproducibility. But let me tell you about the data quickly. You've got the full publication metadata from the Scopus Bibliographic Index. That's 82 million publication records since 1788. 7,000 different publishers. It's not just Elsevier stuff. 1.7 billion cited references and their links between the documents. 17 million author profiles fully cleaned up, 80,000 institutional profiles fully cleaned up, and 234,000 books and counting. We're adding books at a great pace into the Scopus Index right now. And so this is highly harmonized, clean metadata, which is available for research studies. Also, I'll just call out briefly on this slide that we are also now able using NAMSOR naming dictionaries to infer the gender of individual authors as well. So if your study or area of interest also includes gender, then we're able to infer. It's, it's a bit better than a guess, but it's not the same as knowing for sure the gender of an individual, but we can infer that using this approach. And we've deployed that methodology ourselves in different studies that we've published, including the one I've got. We published on all of this. You don't have to take my word for it here in this meeting. You can read all about it yourself. We published in a journal called QSS, Quantitative Science Studies, about uh, this uh, data set, the Scopus data set in particular, and what it can be useful for in research studies for quantitative science. I'll talk very briefly about the PLOMX metrics. These are slightly less well known. They are the altmetric indicators which capture traditional citations between publications, but also new and emerging ways of linking uh, public, uh, references between documents, such as from clinical uh, uh, documents into the research literature. This is real implications for practice-oriented fields where you have citations coming from gray literature beyond the index journal and book literature. We've got captures, forks and followers on GitHub's readers on Mendeley, which is a reading organization tool, SSRN, a pre-printing tool. Um, we have mentions such as blog mentions, mentions in mainstream media, social media, all of that is available in the lab as well. We have something called side -out topics. I won't go into that for you today, but I will say that we've also got a real focus on the emerging importance of the UN Sustainable Development Goals here. What we've gone ahead and done is taken a classical lexical keyword query to identify publications in the Scopus data that are relevant to each of the SDGs. And then we've topped that up with a machine learning approach, which adds roughly another 10%, depending on the SDG, on top of what is retrieved by the lexical query with high precision and equal rates. We also know what publications in the database are published open access through an integration with a service called Unpayroll that you might be familiar with. And finally, we've got the funding acknowledgements. So we even know for each paper, we extract the funding organization from the acknowledgements. We know who was funding each publication right down at that level of aggregation. So if any of your interests flow into those dimensions, these data are available to you here in the lab. We don't just populate this stuff uh, with Elsevier data that we have on hand easily. We're always keen to add more data sets, particularly publicly available data sets, which we can host in the lab and can be used alongside those data sets to enrich studies. And we're always taking feedback from our users about what data sets they would find interesting and useful to incorporate into the lab. You can even bring your own data. Let's say you've got survey data or some other very uh, closely defined, very useful data set for your study that might not be useful for anyone else. Bring it in, upload it into the lab, use it in your study, and then delete it at the end, and it's gone, and you've maintained uh, the protection of that data um, uh, for the purposes of, of data protection and so forth. What we don't have, I need to say this is we don't have the full text of each publication. We've got the title, we've got the abstract, 
you don't have the full text of the publication. There are other ways to get that for Elsevier published journals, but um, we don't have that here in this uh, set. Let's talk a little bit about reproducibility. I said one of the great things about this being a fairly open way to access these data at scale is that we're also building in concepts of reproducibility. The data sets that we put into the lab are stored indefinitely as snapshots in read-only format. So if you ever wanted to go back and redo something, reset the code, change the basis of assumptions of a study and see what changes, you can always go back to the exact same data snapshot that was previously used in another study, even if it wasn't your own study, even if it was published by someone else. The code uh, is always stored in the, in the uh, environment that we use, with Databricks, by the way, it's Databricks that we're using as our interrogation approach here. The code is always stored in notebooks, full version control. If you've ever used Databricks, it tracks every change that's ever made. You can roll back and you can archive those notebooks. You can collaborate in those notebooks. They're fully exportable and shareable uh, with other systems as well. We tend to use Python in the PySpark environment that Databricks is native with, but of course you can code in R and SQL and others as well. And the results are always aggregated data because studies seldom want to look at the individual publication. So we're generally aggregating to uh, people or institutions or journals or fields. And so at that level of aggregation, we enable an export to you as the researcher. And then you can actually re, uh, repost that data set uh, for the purposes of reproducibility and for the purposes of open science as uh, a data set on a public platform. We like the CC BY NCND license. Other licenses are possible. Just uh, at the end of a study, you just uh, talk to us about how you wanted to share that. And we would be uh, uh, quite open to how you wanted to share that on data repositories or alongside your publication if the journal or conference required that. So I'll tell a little bit about who uses the lab and then I'll very briefly, without a slide, just mention about how you would get access. So anyone doing research, especially if you've got an academic affiliation and you're looking to answer a research question, and we have people using the lab today who are master students, PhD students, postdocs, senior researchers, librarians, people, anyone who's got a scholarly research question is welcome. The topic should be of broad interest in the scholarly, bibliometrics, scientometrics, research evaluation community. And someone on the project team should be at least an intermediate plus level coder because there is some coding involved in getting things off the ground. Ideally, you'd be working in a research theme that ICSR is also interested in. So it's things relating to research careers, the practice of research, the globalization of research open science or impact of research beyond academic impact. So we're talking about societal impact here. Inclusivity, gender diversity, for example, or sustainability. And that's where we come back to those UN sustainable development goals as well. So you'd be testing a new or innovative methodology, new metrics, something like that. You'd need large volumes of data, by the way. We have an API for Scopus data, for example. We have ways of getting small amounts of data a few thousand, maybe tens of thousands of records um, for studies out to you without needing the lab. If you want to drink from this fire hose, this is the way to get access to that. And we'd be looking to see that the results are typically shared at conferences or in peer reviewed journal publications. To get access, you'd go to icsr.net. There's an application form there. It's a few fields. It's not like applying for a grant. It's not as exhaustive as that. We just want to know what you'd like to do and check that what we have in the lab could support you in doing that study, that we've got the right data formatted the right way so that you can progress with your study relatively easily. If approved, you're in the lab, you're onboarded, you get the support of a data scientist on our side who would help show you around and get you started in the lab. Um, and then it, you would be uh, coding uh, almost immediately. You could get started with your, your study. And you could have access to the lab for three months, six months, 12 months, uh, for as long as you think you need in order to complete your study in the lab. So you're probably wondering, all right, so what are people actually doing in the lab today? What kind of research is, is happening there? So I've got on this slide and the next one, 
the real titles of research projects that are happening in the lab right now. They've been approved. Um, you've, we've got people onboarded from the project teams behind these research questions, and this is what they're working towards. So as you can see, I structured them according to those thematic areas I mentioned a few minutes ago. So in research practices, for example, some people are looking at topic modeling and citation and bibliographic coupling in networks. Others are looking at predicting citation outcomes from textual author characteristics. Others are looking at practices relating to author self-citations and anonymous, uh, anomalous or manipulative citation practices. In impact of research, there's a lot of focus here on our alternative metrics, those plum X metrics we talked about. So how they are acting as an indicator of research impact in, this, in society, how citations to the peer-reviewed literature, uh, from, sorry, from the peer-reviewed literature to Wikipedia are prevalent and used across different fields. In inclusivity, we've already talked a lot about gender and the way we can infer gender. It's taking a gender slice on certain questions and particularly um, COVID-19 research is very uh, uh, important across uh, various of these projects. In terms of research globalization, we're looking at how researchers move around the world between institutions, between countries, between sectors, out of academia and into industry, and sometimes back again. And how that influences, how political or policy dimensions influence those changes in different countries and over time. And on this next slide, and this is, I think, almost my last slide, um, here we're focusing on uh, the themes relating to sustainability. On the left of your screen, you can see lots of projects. I'm really interested in using this mapping of publications to the UN Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs to understand um, how, how research is supporting these SDGs. In terms of research of careers, we're interested in understanding, for example, or this project is interested in understanding how a researcher's embeddedness in their citation network might be a function of their career stage to help understand who is moving through the citation network at different career stages. In terms of open science, lots of stuff going on here, only, only two shown in this view, but openness um, uh, through that unpaywall tag for what is an open access publication or not is an element of a lot of the other studies here, but how that publishing, published literature um, is being read and used in for example, the Global South um, and how that's supporting open science aims in the Global South as well as the Global North. And finally, science of science policy. Um, here, again, it's the interaction between science and the evidence that science gives about the conduct of science and the policymaker and how they're making decisions on a daily basis about policy for research and research for policy. So with all of that, a very brief tour of ICSR Lab, and I really hope it, you found that interesting. I'll just leave you with a couple of thoughts. Could ICSR Lab be of interest to any of you for a future research study that you're interested in? Here are the only considerations that you have to make. If you are pursuing scholarly research, which is addressable using these data sets, if your research topic is of some relevance to any of the kind of things we've been talking about here, and at least one member of your research team has the ability to code inside this environment, we would encourage your application. We'd love to hear from you. Um, we encourage these kind of, of, of studies and they can be quite exploratory. I wanna emphasize that. Um, they can be testing and iterating. They don't have to be fully formed project proposals like you would send perhaps to a funding organization. They can be quite exploratory, quite ideas led rather than necessarily knowing where the research would end. So with that, I'm just gonna close up and say thank you all very much for your time. And I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Andrew, for the presentation of a really interesting tool. Um, I, I have one question, but is there anything from the hall? No, any, anything on the Q&A? Okay. Uh, let me just ask one, one question. So, um, I said, you, I mean, you said that you are opening, you, you are submitting your citation data to Crossref, right? But now in this tool, you said it's, just, it's kind of a primarily based on, on the Scopus. So what somehow, 
Is there some, are there some features from the Scopus data that are available in the tool that are not in just kind of the citation based? Absolutely right. Thank you. It's a very good question. Um, we have submitted that is Elsevier's publishing arm, that is the journals and books divisions of Elsevier, have submitted the cited reference metadata from what they publish to Crossref alongside hundreds of other publishers who make deposits of that same metadata to Crossref. So Crossref is starting to become a cross-publisher aggregation of uh, publication metadata and the cited reference metadata. In Scopus, we already have all of that for 7,000 different publishers, all the way from the big ones like Elsevier and Springer Nature and Wiley and the ones that you know well, of course, all the way down to publishers that may just publish a single journal or a handful of books every year. And so we have that metadata and it's all consistently structured and harmonized across the entire database um, in one view, by the way, as well. Scopus is everything put together. It's journals. It's also conferences, I should say. Conference proceedings are an important element there too, as well as books, all in one place, rather than broken up into individual indexes that cover different types of outputs. So it's possible to get a whole view of the field, irrespective of whether it's a journals-focused field or a books-focused field or a conference-focused field, as, of course, computer science has long been. So I hope that's a clear answer. Yeah, okay. Thanks. That was very informative. All right, so thanks again, Andrew. So, and uh, we'll move to the next presentation, which is from Alexander Bir Birukov from Springer Nature, Springer Nature Publishing on the topic of initiatives on open meta metadata and open references. So Andrew, uh, sorry, Alexander, please. Okay, thank you, Pekka, for the introduction. Uh, can you all hear me? Can you see my slides? Yes. yes. Good. Yes. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much for the confirmation. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, initiatives uh, we have related to open citations project and uh, in general open metadata. And uh, it's actually very nice to uh, like continue along the lines Andrew uh, said because he uh, talked about a lot of uh, important things like making data openly available for researchers to use it. Uh, he talked also about conference proceedings and inclusion. I want to start actually from the inclusion part because uh, you know, like uh, very often, and uh, you probably have the right uh, audience to talk this uh, about this, we uh, think about research as an article in a journal. And uh, of course, it's not only an article in a journal, uh, like in computer science and some related uh, areas, uh, there are also papers in the conference proceedings published, peer-reviewed, maybe even better peer-reviewed, uh, depending on what your definition of best, more reviewers, longer reviews. Um, than in uh, journals. Uh, when we speak about humanities and social sciences, uh, monographs or, or edited books uh, would play a bigger role sometimes than uh, journal articles. So, so that's, you know, like, I'm not proposing a solution, but I will talk about some related things and I wanted to stress it from the beginning. The second part about inclusion in my talk is uh, language inclusion. You see this um, like list of citations here, right? And you also see some of them are not found on Google Scholar. Uh, maybe if you search good enough, you find them, but at least like it's not something which our algorithms could do. So for instance, uh, the first one is just to introduce, uh, and uh, I heard people speak in Spanish previously, so <laughs> you would understand the problem. Uh, some references are not there in English and some things are not published in English. So for instance, this one is published in Russian. So obviously it's even like uh, original one is uh, written using different alphabet. And uh, like when you put it here as general problem of stability of motion, uh, like you already introduce inconsistency between references and like uh, potential problems with uh, citations or whatever like metrics you want to compute on top. And uh, then there is even more complicated one. Uh, for instance, uh, this one, what originally published in Ukrainian language, like even uh, less widely spread than Russian, uh, in a journal called Nelineni Kolivania uh, in Ukrainian, or called uh, translated in English as nonlinear oscillations. So here you essentially have almost two references. You can reference this one from Ukrainian journal, 
published in 2010, or you can reference this one from uh, English journal published in 2011. Okay, but like let's stop here and um, go to whatever um, uh, we uh, are doing in Springer Nature. So first of all, a couple of words about myself. Uh, for those who don't know me, like I previously was a researcher, then uh, I joined Springer in 2012, and uh, I was responsible for uh, the program of computer science proceedings. So that's why you hear from me also about proceedings. And uh, currently I switched to the journals group and I'm responsible for a big uh, program of translated journals. So that's why you hear also about uh, languages. And um, uh, I am constantly involved in several um, projects, uh, like for instance, um, probably some of you heard about peer review with Elsevier Wiley and a lot of researchers from different disciplines. We analyzed um, journals from different disciplines and how peer review works there, or about a cross ref data site group on persistent identifiers for conferences. Uh, like, um, as Andrew mentioned, Elsevier signed DORA. We also signed DORA as Springer Nature in 2020. But even before that, in 2017, Springer Nature uh, made all uh, reference lists uh, openly accessible via cross ref metadata API. And uh, I don't think I need to go into details of that, but I wanted to share with you the participation reports. So, for instance, uh, you can see your open reference site 100%. And uh, I would like to stress that as a big publisher, uh, I'm pretty sure that's uh, similar for many other big publishers as well. We also work with smaller societies or like smaller, larger, depending on how you look at it, and uh, partners who not necessarily have their own infrastructure for um, even depositing things to Crossref, right? And so, for instance, um, this actually like not the smallest one, it's like one of the biggest cooperations we have. But for instance, I just wanted to show that if you Google a different publisher for whom we distribute the content via our platforms and we provide some kind of technical services, their reference are also 100%. So, you know, like when we are speaking about Springer Nature references being available on Crossref, it's also about Pleiades Publishing, it's also about this small society you never heard of whose journal is published and or distributed by Springer Nature, uh, all their uh, references are also available on Crossref. Um, and uh, also, you know, like uh, speaking about data is a little bit abstract. So I thought, uh, like, let's look at uh, what we did in 2020 with this reference data. And uh, my colleagues um, uh, in uh, other departments, uh, like uh, I would like to thank here uh, Lutz Bint, uh, they uh, gave uh, this data. So in 2020, we uh, uh, had around 400,000 articles and 294 chapters. Chapters for Springer Nation include also uh, conference papers. And uh, this means that we deposited approximately 5 million references from articles and 3.5 million references from uh, chapters. And um, uh, fun fact is that for nature journals, uh, reference lists are much longer, and uh, it's average 41 reference per article, uh, maximum is 1700 references, so you can see the proof on the right, it goes to 1700. Um, then another related initiative uh, was uh, Springer Nature SciGraph, uh, which now continues in one form or another with uh, digital science. So the uh, SciGraph uh, contained a lot of uh, open metadata, uh, or not so open, but like for each uh, metadata, there was a clear license, how you can use it and so on. Um, and um, you can uh, download uh, those dumps from uh, uh, Springer Nature websites, which uh, if I remember correctly, like lead to Figshare. Then also in uh, beginning of last year, we did uh, extra release of uh, conference details uh, on Figshare. So that contained uh, all conference published in computer science by Springer Nature so far, acronym, name of the conference, number of the conference, uh, and uh, information about peer review. Because we started collecting this information uh, systematically, I will talk about it later. And. Uh, that perfectly uh, brings me to this um, couple of slides I have about conference uh, activities uh, regarding metadata. 
So in 2013, we started collaborating with LOD2 project, Link Open Data 2 project, uh, uh, in particular with University of Mannheim, but also with other participants. And uh, uh, like uh, we got involved in this project because actually uh, in discussions with Google Scholar, we understood that it's hard to identify conference. And, you know, like if you have ISWC, it might be International Semantic Web Conference, so it might be International Symposium on Wearable Computers. And um, uh, they change acronyms uh, every couple of years uh, and uh, they change countries almost every year and so on. So at this times, of course, conference were primarily physical. Uh, now they are also virtual. And basically there was the problem you couldn't solve with existing infrastructure like ISSNs. Uh, to identify conference which change publishers, places, uh, published proceedings, not necessarily published proceedings and so on. So we uh, collaborated with this research project to um, create a unique ident identifier for conference metadata and implemented it in uh, Springer uh, nature platforms. So on the right, you see a screenshot from Springer link which uh, lists uh, all proceedings from joint uh, European Conference on Machine Learning and Knowledge Discovery in Databases, ECML, PKDD, uh, from different years, no matter in which series they published and so on, because uh, technically those would be like different proceedings books on Springer link, but here they are all brought together and you can see like how many papers uh, were published uh, in uh, which series. And uh, the concept was, uh, basically they're at the right time. Uh, so we started collaborating also with other publishers and infrastructure providers. So like DBLP or Elsevier presented the workshop uh, to provide um, unique persistent identifiers for conference metadata. Um, Ah, yeah, and uh, here you can just see like how internally it looks. So you have acronym, uh, you have the city, country, you have dates, uh, you have link to the website, name of the conference, and unique identifier. And uh, so we launched this um, cross uh, party, uh, cross company uh, working group, cross rep data site. Uh, in 2017, uh, shortly after the first uh, Pidapalooza conference. Uh, on the right, you can see group participants. Uh, we started this technical implementation in February 2019. Uh, now, I must be honest, uh, it slowed down a little bit because of the uh, COVID and uh, conferences like moving virtual and um, uh, like being not on the top of the agenda. But uh, still, so the group is there and we agreed on the main principles on, uh, you know, like uh, how conference metadata should be available under CC0 because there should be like no question even uh, whether uh, like there is commercial license for this or not no no no. like it's public domain and you can read more about the group or um, metadata documents uh, uh, in the links in the slides and then um, since I mentioned peer review I also wanted uh, to um, uh, encourage the workshop to discuss uh, not only citations but uh, also peer review because uh, so we have this uh, effort uh, for open taxonomy of peer review from uh, again several important players in the scientific publishing fields but um, even earlier in this peer review project we started um, pilot these um, peer review processes on conferences so we um, identified uh, how people describe peer review at conferences uh, no, uh, and uh, we text mined available uh, prefaces from lecture notes in computer science series in order to understand uh, like what was put there by uh, organizers. And um, uh, the resulting fields were implemented in Crossmark and linked via this persistent conference identifier Springer Nature already had. And uh, here is how it looks. So if you go to specific lecture notes in computer science, uh, book uh, then uh, for a specific paper you can click on cross mark and then you will get in more information uh, this um, information about a conference and about peer review so uh, this available there since end 2018 uh, last time I checked, it's still under more information, even though like we discussed with Crossmarks that one day it would be nice to have it prominently as like peer review and even maybe more prominently here on uh, websites, but uh, like it's important that information is there 
It's also available for those researchers who want to understand, for instance, if uh, high acceptance rate uh, uh, leads to less citations or low acceptance rate uh, leads to more citations, or whether there is any difference in terms of citations between a conference using single blind or double blind uh, um, peer review process. Uh, yeah, and uh, the conference uh, information, I do think it's relevant for open citation project because uh, sometimes you would have a citation like um, ISWC 2019 uh, Athens Greens, and then only using this information, you will be able to decipher, ah, okay, it's uh, that acronym and that uh, like uh, city, so it must be this conference and uh, resolve this. Uh, right, so that's about uh, conference part. Uh, last but not least, um, this discussion point I want to put uh, before the participants uh, is uh, uh, language diversity. So you can watch uh, my talk on SAIFU about this, where I give examples and uh, give some uh, history of how, you know, like this kind of uh, initiatives like translated journal project programs uh, in the uh, ex-Soviet Union uh, came to light. I also briefly mentioned other initiatives like, um, you know, in Latin America, there are a lot of uh, journals who publish in several languages or translated journals. And uh, so here's an example from ex-Soviet Union. So there is a Russian journal, uh, Nove Ognyopore, uh, which is known to uh, international community as refractories and industrial ceramics. And here you have in Google Scholar the same article in Russian and the same article in English. And, uh, you know, like, uh, for instance, when it comes to research evaluation, if, for instance, uh, Gorokhovsky uh, were employed by, say, Italian university, would this citation count? Would this citation count? Both citations count? I don't have an answer, but at the moment we start saying yeah only things in english are important uh, and let's only focus on this version we are making decisions that uh, this actually doesn't matter and i think it's quite a statement uh, thank you very much for your attention i'm happy to answer any questions okay so Thank you. Thanks again for a very interesting presentation and, and all, all information about all these tools that you have available. It's very valuable. So, um, any questions from the audience on the Q&A? Um, so, since you brought up this issue of you know, multi sort of supporting different languages and integrating information in different languages, is there a program for Chinese in, in Springer Nature similar to this Russian? I actually, uh, funny enough, you know, like I checked not only Chinese, but also Japanese, Korean, uh, German language and other programs we have. Uh, historically, we don't publish translated journals there. So somehow like their communities were more like we start in our own language, uh, for instance, like in China. The moment we are mature enough, we start publishing like in English an English language journal, even though maybe like it's primarily driven by our community from China, but it's still completely in English language. So the history of these um, ex-Soviet Union uh, journals uh, is uh, that um, retired army veteran uh, Earl Coleman in the um, uh, United States in 1949 started translating research from Soviet Union to bring basically things from one side of the iron wall <laughs> to, to another side mm -hmm. and uh, like i'm pretty sure he made good money on it but but that's how the program started in the right time and now more or less like when communities see that look uh, we publish uh, everything in english it just gets us directly to the readers they don't do it one thing which exists in german program is when they have a journal which publishes articles in several languages so for instance one can be in german one can be in english Funny enough, if you look at first volumes of LNCS, you can have the article in English, in French, and German next to each other. It just somehow like over years, we started, no, 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 like research is only in English. And I think it's now time to rethink this paradigm and uh, remember that like research is not done in English most of the time. Yeah. So thanks again. And, um...
So. Okay, so, <clears throat> so now let's move to the more like a community discussion f f s yeah, mode. So, yeah, China, yeah, so this is um, mm, this Zoom webinar is not the ideal platform for like um, uh, workshops because it's so. Yeah, so Silvio, but uh, I, I hope we can work with now with everyone being a panelist, so. Um, okay, so um, maybe let, let's start a, a bit about, you know, general impressions and ideas that have um, a kind of a, as a, as a kind of a, as, as have, a, have been raised from the presentations. So we do have this very concrete uh, initiative of this open letter that I would also like to get to and get the feedback on that one and sort of discuss. But, but let's just kind of general um, questions and, and uh, ideas and on the topic of, you know, of bibliometrics in computing or informatics and tools to support the bibliometrics, or should one be doing the bibliometrics in the first place? And, and uh, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so how do we get that? Sorry? Okay, yeah, yeah. So, I think there was this, I already tried to say this earlier, but not maybe not in a very clear way, but there is a distinction between assessing individuals and assessing institutions. And I, I do agree that in assessing individuals, so one should be very careful in using bibliometrics for that. But for institutions, you know, I think bibliometrics combined with uh, some kind of um, expert assessment is maybe a kind of right, right way to go. And, and, um, and, and we are at a little bit kind of disadvantaged in, in computer science departments or informatics departments because our colleagues our publication culture is not the same as with our co colleagues in other sciences and would be valuable to have a, some kind of a tool that sort of a, that we can point to and say, well, yes, we know that, you know, the, what the web of science numbers, they are like this, but now look, we have this, like this DBLB numbers and they look very different. And also this notion of getting information about citations across fields is, would be very, I think you mentioned this. I think for, I'm, 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 I'm very much in an interdisciplinary, do interdisciplinary work myself. So I, I'm really would be curious to know about these things. So how much of computing is used and in which ways by, by the other areas? So just having a kind of a bibliometric study of this. One can look at some of the qualitative things as we have done in this, um, curriculum project that we'll be discussing later in the afternoon, but just in public bibliometry. So which areas of other sciences are citing which areas of computing? This would be a very interesting project. So. Okay, anyway, so, but uh, any idea, any other? There was also in, in Klaus Tochterman's very, I think, to the point presentation, there was very good advice on how to set up but what would be the requirements for expectations for setting up uh, development projects in this direction? We already had a little chat with Silvio yeah. during the coffee break about this. And, um, if I may start up the, the thing, because you, you, there are a bunch of aspects that are of interest for what you have said before. So. Uh, institutional, using bibliometrics for assessing institutions that is the first thing, and the other thing is the multidisciplinary um, identi well, the, the, the identification of the disciplines within citation clusters, basically in order to understand from which discipline, which discipline cites which disciplines and these kind of things. So, mm, I'm talking about my personal experience by r doing this kind of research because I like this kind of work, but also as um, um, uh, let's say uh, one of of the maintainers of an infrastructure dealing with citations. For doing this very um, interesting 
things at scale and has also was suggested in previous presentations as well, um, citations are not enough. I mean, citations allow you to calculate the metrics, the bibliometrics, but for instance, if you want to define disciplinary boundaries, you need also classifications of these entities. I'm not talking here, uh, wh when I, I think about entities, I'm not talking only about publication. Okay, publication are the usual stuff that is everywhere, but uh, there is also software, there is also data sets, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so there are a lot of outputs of research that should be considered. So there is this heterogeneity, heterogeneity of outputs that should be considered, but in addition to that, in order to, done, to do these kind of studies across disciplines, we need uh, to adopt some sort of taxonomies for classifying each single output according to one or more specific disciplines. And these kind of data, for instance, are not in open citations right now. When I run some of these studies for understanding the relations between disciplines, um, I use external services. Uh, for instance, just to mention a few, Saimago, uh, that provides a taxonomy for the, the venues, so the journals, basically speaking, or the Library of Congress uh, classification that provides different taxonomy for books uh, that allow you basically to understand which kind of discipline you are considering for which uh, publication. So this information is crucial, but is not included in open citations right now, maybe it is included in other databases and collections and services that will be available through the European Open Science Cloud uh, in the next years, but it is, it is really a, an effort of, um, of understanding how to federate this information in order to obtain all the data that you need for these kind of things. And similar situation is about uh, the, the, the say, uh, bibliometrics at, at the institution level. In order to understand to, to calculate these kind of metrics as, at scale uh, and make this calculation transparent and so on, and so on you, you need not only citations, but also, uh, let's say, the identification of the institutions that are linked to each product of the research that is part of the, research, uh, of the citation itself. So you need affiliation associated to these products. And this kind of, kind of information can, are not provided by open citation right now, but they are there somewhere. There are beautiful initiatives like ROAR, which is trying to provide a, a unique identifier for organization at the very higher level. So we are talking about the university, not the various department within it. Within it. But also open air, for instance, has these kind of links between uh, articles and organizations that um, well, were the researcher who wrote that article were affiliated with for the specific article in consideration. So uh, it's really a matter of first having different sources where you can get the metadata that you need uh, for calculating this kind of bibliometrics. But some of those are still something that is not complete. Affiliation is a very important hot topic, hot topic let's say, but the, the collections that are out there mm. in public repositories are not extremely, um, uh, let's say, they, they do, do not have a high coverage mm. of the thing. So it's something that we should work on, I think, in the next years uh, in order to allow exactly what you had yeah. said to, yeah. would be great to have. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I somehow expect it's not not so easy to ask the researchers to provide all this metadata <laughs> information. It's, and also there's a huge volume of, you know, backlog publications. So probably one needs some, you know, classification tools, you know, uh, institution type of paper connected with some network analysis and machine learning and whatnot to get the rough, rough classification into areas because, you know, to <laughs> Considering the volume of publication in existence, so nobody is going to go and you know, annotate those with uh, well, explicit metadata. The, the journals, the publisher provides this kind of information mm -hmm. to their own article, but 
uh, they use their own taxonomy. So you yeah. need any way yeah. to have yeah. an alignment across publisher yeah. in order to, yeah. to do that, the thing at the general, at general okay. level. Yeah, and so. Michelle, want to. Kit one? Yeah. Sorry, this is. Mm -hmm. I, uh, if I may, uh, I just wanted uh, to, uh, to point out that one of the, the arguments um, Silvio just did is, is very important to me. This, this is about the availability of the data. I guess we, we all too often try to, capital, uh, to cap, uh, tackle the pro, uh, problem from the side of what's the right metric to use or so. And I guess this is too many steps ahead. We should really, in the beginning, focus on do we have the data or the data that we need? And this is really the, the, the big lacking uh, situation currently that we have uh, um, we have a limited amount of data in the public openly. We have some data away hidden in commercial products. We have some data away hidden in open community projects that are not interlinked or not federated enough to make the data available. And this is really, I guess, the, still the, the big first challenge we need to tackle is to open up the data as much as possible, to interlink the data as much as possible. And also, uh, just as uh, Klaus Tochtermann pointed out, to have maybe good working individual local um, endeavors like DBLP is a local endeavor since we just focus on computer science, to have them uh, make interoperable with other endeavors that exist and make the, um, and have a federated landscape of openly available data. And then we can start arguing about metrics and how to count and, and should a journal be double as uh, uh, much points as, as, as a conference or not. And this, these are details that can come at the point when we have uh, solved the problem of having the data available to the, um, for the tasks we're trying to study. Yeah. So, Paolo, you, you are asking for turn. Yes. Uh, good morning from Rome. And well, I, I just want to make a brief comment, uh, a bit concerned, by the way. Uh, I really like very much all the discussions and presentations uh, I heard today about uh, the way we can, uh, let's say, document our research production uh, in all possible ways, uh, which go from uh, uh, bibliographies uh, to uh, references and documentation of reference and so forth. And I think we should really work in this direction and uh, the effort uh, on uh, the, the, the open citation is definitely an effort uh, which has to be supported and in fact uh, uh, even if in an informal way because uh, we have not had a formal vote i would like to say that my association the gii the association of uh, computer engineering professors in italy is definitely going to support this uh, this initiative we really appreciate it but let me say that the real support is in terms of uh, transparency is in terms of having the, 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 the availability of uh, the, the documentation uh, on our research. A completely different uh, subject is that of uh, measurement, assessment, evaluation, however you want to call it. They are three different things, but they go more or less in the same, in the same direction. Uh, it is, I mean, as a computer scientist, especially as a database professor, I, really, I am really interested and I am really glad that we do have data available. But then the, the use of the, this data, especially uh, the use of this data to, to measure or to evaluate phenomena which require human intervention is something which uh, really concerns me. So uh, I definitely, let me say, as a summary, I really liked today's talks and the content of what was developed. I'm not sure I liked the title of the session because the title of the session is evaluation. And I do believe that uh, this is not the way to do evaluation. This is the way to document what we are doing. And then human beings will have to evaluate on the basis of these pieces of information. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So, thanks, Paolo, for the comments. We, we definitely need to come back to this research assessment evaluation from the perspective that you indicate. It just so happened that 
this particular initiative was somehow on the table and we wanted to bring it to discussion and there's opportunity to you know, talk about that, that, that this, this opportunity. But uh, actually, uh, Enrico wanted to have the floor. I hope he has nobody in the, on the <coughs> online, right? No hands. No, ju ju just to comment that uh, uh, Paolo observation was, was correct. I mean, the title of the session, Research Evaluation, uh, was uh, beyond what we actually discussed that was uh, focusing on how to collect data to make data transparent. I, I, I fully uh, share his viewpoint that evaluation is a, a, a human-driven activity that has to be highly carefully uh, designed and implemented and cannot be left to just automatic tool, otherwise things will be very bad for, for, for us and in general. Okay, so this is just a, a, a remark, but I mean, mistakes happen so and you as human beings can understand so no no, no problem at all uh, i may suggest that maybe we focus now on the on the open letter so that we try to have a discussion around it um, okay so actually but before moving to letter so maybe i just still just while klaus is still somewhere on 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 the uh, you know uh, on our virtual, on our virtual world. So, um, I think there are some very concrete um, ideas about how to maybe build a project. Um, like as, as uh, also Marcel was saying about from, by, by federating these uh, data, data sources and building some kind of a open. Um, bibliometric assessment supporting tool from this federation of um, databases such as the DBLP and, and this, uh, this uh, Leipzig LZ, 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 LZV database and others like this. So, so maybe um, somehow we can, in some, some setting, it's too bad, Klaus, that we cannot talk to you in person now that you're, you are out there, but maybe we can somehow return to this and, or maybe Silvio can and take the initiative and, and talk in more, de more detail about this, because I think it seems like there would be an opportunity to do something on a, on a bigger scale there, and, right, Silvio? Yeah, yes, the, so. the, the important thing here is, as I, we, we just chatted, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, we just chatted before, is just mm, to, to try to focus not only on one specific discipline, but try to involve let's say disciplines that are uh, meaningful to be involved in order to start a pilot with more than one disciplinary area involved in order to see how this interoperability uh, also among the various collections may work, how we can set it up. And I agree with Paolo uh, since, since I'm speaking. Uh, well, uh, at Open Citations, of course, we, we provide things that can be used for assessment in general, but we are interested in the documental part. So we are collecting this data. Then if we have good data and people want to use it to convey research assessment of person or institutions or whatever, they are free to do so, but we are not going to create metrics, let's <laughs> say, for for doing that. Uh, we are just collecting the data and making the data available. So uh, in this perspective, having open citation, having other databases that are disciplinary um, focused and that curate data uh, by, by humans and try to understand possible say ways for making them speaking with each other in order to build additional service upon them that may, may be useful to the overall goal of the EOSC and the new Horizon Europe call on uh, assessment of open science really not only just about citations but about having a network and knowledge graph of information which is reach from disciplinary, multiple disciplinary point of views, and that can be used for assess open science is really the goal of all these systems. The problem is here, the challenge is to enable mechanisms that allow all of them to talk with each other and to allow people to access uh, this information as they are just in a one single centralized container, even if they are actually contained in a decentralized um, collection. So 
I think there is opportunity for a discussion there in order to involve multiple discipline disciplines and let's say collection this discipline collection all together in order to devise some possible case studies for implementing something that is useful to track open science at least in these disciplines so uh, Klaus if I may in making in the future I would like to start to discuss with you about that more concretely to see what we can do basically yes, yes, such a discussion, and I think that's a valuable way um, uh, to start with the science dance players. That's a very typical approach in these discipline projects because nobody can expect us to cover all the science, all players in the science system. So we can uh, identify, like, second systems to EPIP um, uh, and then uh, let's federate them and use that as a science, um, uh, science demonstrator. Maybe we could also extend it to uh, at least research data because there are research uh, data search engines, for example, like Mendeley is also offering a search um, for research data. And Google does the same with its Google data search. So that, um, and on that, we just have not one type of objects which we um, use for open science assessment. So we should be multidisciplinary and we should cover different types of digital objects yeah which be, um, as a computer scientist I would be interested in software for instance uh, which is crucial for us and that is not considered in uh, often in any research assessment you can think of so uh, this is just some measures of you uh, another kind of item that I agree with you multidisciplinary and multi uh, Mode. Yeah, multimodality in terms of the say kind of entities involved yeah. in, uh, in the whole thing. I yeah. totally agree. Okay, thanks. So now, as uh, Enrico said, so we would also want to have your feedback and also discuss this uh, open letter that we prepared. It's a kind of collaborative thing between Informatics Europe and, and this. Uh, right. Okay. So. Who wants to introduce this letter? Enrico wants to. Enrico. I'm glad to give the mic to you. Uh, yes, can, can we make the, the text a bit larger? Okay, so uh, the, the, the idea of the letter came out uh, while uh, organizing this, uh, this, this session. And basically, as you have um, heard from the presentation by, by Silvio, um, these open citations uh, effort uh, in a few years uh, have had a good success, but not all citations are there because some publishers are not uh, uh, opening their citation data. So the idea of this open letter was uh, to, 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 to write as a, a community, the research community in informatics uh, from the National Association to write an open letter to all the publishers, uh, inviting all of them to, to uh, make them their citations available as open citation uh, uh, for the community. Uh, clearly, some of them already uh, uh, have made uh, them available, uh, and we have uh, two of them uh, today here at Sevier and Springer, and I thank them for on, on behalf of the community. So clearly, the letter is addressed to all publishers, but it's clearly targeting the ones that uh, are not making have not made uh, yet uh, available their uh, open citation so the text has been prepared by the by by silvio and um, pekka and me and uh, uh, yeah and david okay so and this is a draft that we have sent to all the national informatics association and the idea was uh, if possible to come today with the national associations that are uh, present uh, uh, either physically here or remotely to come to an agreed version uh, if possible and then if possible this uh, uh, will become the, the the version that we will invite all national informatics association to sign and after that it will be uh, published on uh, our website and uh, will be open to further signatures from uh, other association and from departments. And we are thinking uh, 
maybe also to open them to the signature uh, from individuals, but on their personal capacity as, as individuals. What, what will be important, we feel, is the fact that the national communities sign them because this will show that there is a, a common interest in, uh, in, in all countries. Um, so I don't know, we can, uh, I don't know exactly how to organize this process that is made even more uh, challenging by the fact that half of you are remotely and half are uh, uh, physically here, but maybe we can uh, go paragraph by paragraph and uh, we can read it. Uh, and uh, if there is some comment of some uh, um, request for clarification, we can provide them. Okay, so the, the letter says uh, in April 2017, six organizations announced the establishment of the Initiative for Open Citations, a collaboration between scholarly publishers, researchers, and other interested parties to promote the unrestricted availability of scholarly citation data. The main goal of this initiative has been to convince all major publishers to freely share their bibliographic metadata and citation data through appropriate infrastructures such as that provided by Crossref. So this is basically a, 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 a statement of the of the actual facts. Um, is there any comment? Okay, so I go to the second paragraph. The open availability of citation data is crucially important in science since open citation data can improve the transparency, reproducibility, and robustness of assessment exercise and policy decision making and can help in illuminating possible issues in science evaluation and referencing practices. So we now start entering into the motivation of why this is important. So the, 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 the expressions are more, uh, the words, I mean, starts weighing more. So Gerald, you have a comment I've seen. Okay. Um, uh, Enrico, um, I'm not sure. Is, this, is it really important uh, to focus on research assessment uh, exercises here? Um, uh, uh, since I think um, uh, Paolo was right, uh, the most important thing is to have this kind of transparency uh, so that the data is open uh, to all, yeah? And um, the other thing is what we want to do with it, yeah? Um, of course, the data should be and can be uh, the basis for political decisions and so on. But um, if you uh, point at um, uh, or focus at assessment exercises, uh, we um, uh, raise expectations. Um, I think um, we do not want uh, to um, be the main point here. Yeah, um, since we have seen, everybody says uh, elsewhere. For example, they have signed Dora. Um, uh, they have signed uh, the Leiden Manifesto, and they all say assessment is not only metrics and data. So I wouldn't focus only or mainly on that. Thanks. OK. I, I, any other comment on this? Uh, uh, this Alex here, I, I actually would agree with uh, Geralt uh, that uh, I don't think it's only about assessment. And actually, it would be nice in kind of selling this to the community which is not with you yet because i think like uh, here you all understand the benefits of open citations on like why would you need open citations because it's like means to what so like assessment is one of these but also um, like uh, transparency for what so so a little bit let me maybe like give you an example which is a little bit from different area like um uh, which is close to i must be careful with the language but uh, kind of like uh, maybe not, not so like normal activities. Uh, so in the recent uh, research uh, ranking of universities um, in times higher education, if I remember correctly, some Russian universities, uh, which uh, were not previously known internationally, they popped up high. And when they started investigating why it happened, it was down to like citation, um, like, which uh, they were getting more citations than like uh, ETH Zurich, for instance, right? Which says something about you no know, name university gets more citations than ETH Zurich. Um, and um, 
if data about these citations uh, used for the ranking was openly available, you could quickly check it with the community and say, look, actually these citations come from these journals which are not indexed anywhere and so on. So do you see this point? Okay, so is there any suggestion from you on how to change this paragraph to reflect uh, your viewpoint? Oh, I, I don't have concrete suggestions, uh, maybe like Gerald has, uh, but it, it, I agree with like, we, we should, uh, it would be better if you mention not only assessment here, but at, at um, other examples appealing to like broader uh, st list of stakeholders. How about saying that you also improve the quality of research? with the support to, to the research activity. Sounds great. So you would say the, the open availability of citation data would, would support research activity? Um, so I That's suggest not, I mean, to add other fields, okay. such as, for example, well, if a, a researcher wants to familiarize uh, herself with a field or whenever you want to do something like a systematic literature um, review or things like that, uh, open citations is truly helpful. It's not, not only assessment. So, sorry, just to organize uh, the things so that uh, we understand wh what we are doing. Silvio, could, could you please come here uh, and uh, try to uh, show uh, the suggestions working on this document. Uh, um, I'm not. I'm not quite sure that we can do this in a kind of community editing way. Yeah, yeah. So, but I sort of. I also understand the point that we shouldn't focus too much on this assessment because that's, there's there is Dora and there's much uh, um, emphasis that the assessment at the individual level should not be, you know, number counting, but it should be, you know, uh, personal kind of a substantive assessment. So, but on the other hand, the statement does mention the issues that were, I think, were raised is, is this kind of this other part was on policy making to some extent, also this possible issue in science evaluation referencing practices, which is like this kind of analysis pertaining to the scientific community and the scientific uh, practices like like a, like a science study is based on this uh, reference data. Maybe one should somehow just emphasize this part more, in the, more clearly in this. That yeah, because the, the transparency part should be there, because transparency applies yes. to all these kinds of yeah. things that may happen. Uh, research assessment is, a, a, if, you, if I may, a not topic on the yeah. things, but maybe we can even put it not as the first one. Yes, yeah. 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 I think we we have the message, but we ne need to reformulate the sentence yeah, to. So we, we may, let's, you know, just get the feedback and then we do a reformulation of the statement, then we and serve. Gerard, want to say okay, so, you know. so please speak, uh, Gerald. Uh, I, um, I would suggest uh, to add uh, accessibility to the data, uh, transparency and Okay, so given also the time constraints, let's uh, go on with reading the letter. Uh, otherwise, we will be focusing only on one uh, topic and we will not have the possibility of getting feedback on, on everything. Um, okay, so the third paragraph is as, uh, as reported on the I4OC website in October 2021. 
Over the past four years, the fraction of publications with open references has grown from 1% to 88% of the 56.9 million articles uh, references deposited with Crossref. The huge availability of open citation data has permitted the creation of several national and international infrastructure and collections, such as blah, 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 and the data made available on Wikidata by Wikisite community. These have been reused by several applications and services, such as DBLP and Boss Viewer. In February 2021, the availability, the availability of open citations data worldwide surpassed the important threshold of 1 billion citations, and it continues to grow. Uh, I think this is also a statement of, of facts. There is, I think there is no comment, but I will ask people remotely if they want to comment somehow. Okay, I don't see any comment. So going to the fourth paragraph, um, several publisher, publishers working with informatics scholars and professionals, including the Association for Computing Machinery, Elsevier and Springer Nature, have joined the I4OC and are actively contributing to the release of such open citation data. However, the coverage of open citation data of informatics research is far from being complete, and some publishers, including some of the largest ones, are still unsympathetic towards opening their, art their article reference list already deposited at Crossref. So here we are stating the issue, the problem that we want to, we want to address. Is there any comment on this paragraph? Al Alex. So, yeah. please. so I commented to pick up uh, previously. Uh, I, I would suggest you formulating the second uh, 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 sentence here to kind of show a little bit more um, empathy to those publishers uh, because uh, it reads currently that like, and uh, those guys are doing bad things and so on. While I have personal experience, for instance, working in a small society where when I arrived, I explained that, you know, like DUI is not just you put it on the paper, you also need to go to Crossref and register it, you know, because before, like, nobody did it for 30,000 uh, papers. And somehow, like, I would feel you have more data on this. So, like, please feel free to dismiss this comment if it's not relevant. But, like, I feel there will be, like, a lot of small societies and so on who are just, like, technically incapable of doing this. And therefore, like, you would need to help them and educate them. Uh, rather than saying, look, uh, like, uh, I don't know, like they're making money with this data instead of making it openly available and so on. Uh, okay, so thanks, Alex. Do you have any specific quick suggestion on how to change this or you want to, you would like to think about it and maybe send... Uh, send... Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe like remove the word unsympathetics uh, and uh, um, state the fact that they haven't opened the data yet. And maybe like as a community, think about how you could help them in a sense, apart from telling, look, please open, please open. Uh, so for instance, go in, you know, like by how many not open, speaking to them. Uh, I, I might again, uh, like don't remember the whole details, but in a um, conference ID group, we discussed uh, some things with uh, ACM and IEEE. Uh, because like uh, their data about conference was not open and so on. But like, for instance, when ACM realized uh, these four references, uh, they then opened it. Uh, so some, sometimes it might be like talking and explaining. Yeah, so so maybe, maybe we could just uh, change the last part from are still unsympathetic, just saying that have not yet opened their um, article. Yeah, that would be factual and like no negative implication. Okay. Okay, okay, so we will, we will do like this. Um, okay, so can we go, did something change? Can you still hear me remotely? Uh, I'm sorry, like I, I would need to leave in a minute uh, and I don't have uh, more comments on the letter, uh, but um, as I told to Pekka, uh, Pekka uh, so basically if you want, uh, uh, kind of, if you consider uh, uh, publishers also signing it and so on, just get back to me, I can uh, facilitate the process. Yeah. Uh, but it's also absolutely fine if it's just a community letter. Yeah, okay, so th th thanks, Alex. We, we, we are targeting uh, National Informatic Association for signature, but of course, if some publishers want to sign it, we will not be against because it's, it's up to you. So we will be happy if you do, but I mean, you are, you are completely free to, to, to choose according well, to your... Like if your primary target is a National Informatics Association. Yes. 
Okay, yes. perfect. Then thank you very much for the interesting workshop and uh, have a nice rest of the day. Okay. Bye. And thanks for your availability. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, Alex. Bye. Okay, so we now read the last paragraph. By means of this letter, we urge those publishers with closed references or with references that have not been submitted to a central repository such as Crossref to change their stance and to confirm their willingness to work for the benefit of informatics and the whole of humanity by releasing their citations the core element of scholarly communication that permit the attribution of credit and integrate our independent research endeavors, and by so doing to acknowledge their citation data as public good. So this is the appeal, the call to action that we, 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 we make. Uh, again, comment? The only comment I have is a positive one, in the sense that here the letter says uh, that uh, uh, the idea is to support research and the good that comes from research rather than assessment uh, and mm, yeah. issues. So this is really important. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, thanks, Paolo. So this is actually, actually this, this is the concept that should uh, um, be like a fil rouge across the letter, I mean, to support research and the, and the, the public good. Okay. So if there is no more comment, I think that pending the revision of a second paragraph, according to what's suggested by uh, Gerald and, and the others, uh, we can consider this letter as, uh, as approved. So we will circulate among the people that have been involved here and remotely in uh, uh, preparing it, uh, a revised version. And hopefully, we, we will, with one more round, we will be there we, at, at the final version. After that, we will start the, the publication process. So if there is no more comment, uh, I would like to thank you all for having actively participated, having, in some cases, uh, changed your schedule to be able to, to, to be with us. And we highly appreciate this. And um, of course, thanks also to, to all people here. And I will give the floor to, to Pekka, uh, that I thank also for having uh, been the local organizer for Informatic Europe. Pekka. Okay. Yes, OK. Thank Enrico. Thanks, everyone. So this concludes our morning session. Now we have a lunch break until 2, right? Like an hour and a half. And then, I mean, whoever is uh, still joining us, so we'll reconvene at 2 to uh, review the data collection on the informatics in, in interdisciplinary curricula. And then we'll have a kind of little concluding session about where to go next, what should be the next, what should be the topic of our next meeting, and maybe also when, when should we meet next. So, but so anyway, now lunch break, and I hope to see many of you back here at home.